Okay, can you all hear me all right? All right, cool. Okay, my name is Ian Warshak. I am a uh, developer. I work at RightScale. Uh, RightScale has a cloud, uh, cloud platform management tool for you all to use. Um, I have some code that I'm going to be showing you, and there's the GitHub account that you can check it out at. I won't be showing a whole bunch of it, so you can look at it on your own. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Rails in the cloud. Um, the reason I want to be doing that, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going over, it's mostly Amazon, almost exclusively, exclusively Amazon's uh, web services and, and their cloud uh, platform and, and their cloud-based uh, services. And I'm going to be kind of walking you through a simple kind of arbitrary app that I wrote specifically for this. It doesn't do a whole bunch. It's, it's kind of arbitrary. It's kind of silly. But um, hopefully that will kind of give you an idea as to if, if you're writing Rails applications and you want to kind of leverage some of these Rails tools, um, this will kind of give you some ideas how you can do that. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was talk about, uh, I just wanted to kind of differentiate. When we talk about the cloud, it's kind of a big nebulous term that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, so I, I kind of separate stuff into two buckets, the cloud infrastructure, which you know, means servers. There's Amazon EC2, of course, they're the big one. Uh, Rackspace, and there's, uh, they're coming up, and FlexiScale and GoGrid. And then there's cloud services. You know, we call them like, uh, like Amazon's S3 or Amazon's Simple Q services. Um, so those are more services and not infrastructure. So I wrote this app and, uh, specifically for this, and it's called Pictor. And, and it was a play on Flickr, and I kind of thought of it as labeling it like the Flickr killer because it can just scale. And I thought, that's so stupid. That's pretentious. And I, it was just a ridiculous idea. So um, that's, the, that's the app that I'm going to be showing you. And it's a simple photo application. Um, you upload a photo. Uh, the application transforms it in a couple ways and does some operations on the photo. And then it displays them on the home page. Um, like I said, it's not real impressive. Um, but some of the interesting things are that the photos are, are converted and processed asynchronously. And uh, again, it's a, it's a simple app. And I'm going to be talking about the technologies behind it. And, uh, but hopefully it kind of gives you some ideas as to how you can use some of these technologies for your own, uh, for your own stuff. Why did I pick this? Um, well, the photo application idea, I picked it because it has a lot of things that lend itself naturally to uh, cloud computing. Uh, and some of the tools that are out there, like lots of disk storage. There's Amazon S3. Um, pictures, you know, obviously take, can start to take up a lot of disk space. Um, lots of bandwidth, P people, downloading, people downloading these pictures. The offline processing is because it, processing these photos, which I'm using image magic, um, can take time. You, it's not something you want to be doing as someone, you know, when someone uploads a picture, you don't want them waiting around for response for this photo to convert or be resized or whatever it is you want it to do. And of course, it's going to be an instant hit, and we, we're going to need this to scale just like right out, right out of the gate like everyone thinks, right? Yeah, so don't get your hopes up. It's nothing very impressive. So if I were writing this for real, why would I want to use some of this cloud infrastructure and these cloud services? Um, and I, and I, here's a list of reasons. And some of them is I, I don't want to build or configure hardware. I don't want to be calling a place and, and saying, oh, I'm going to sign a lease for 10 servers because I'm anticipating that I'm going to need 10 servers, that I'm going to, I'm going to anticipate my, what my servers are going to need to be and my disk usage. Um, I don't want to do that. I, don't, I, I want to offload as much as possible because let's say I'm a small team or I'm one developer. Um, I don't want to be managing disks or, or uh, storage solutions. It's, or I want to be doing it as little as possible. Um, so so this, that's why this kind of lends itself to it. So, so what, how did I use to build this app? And I'll show you the app here in just a little bit. Um, it's a Rails application. It's very small. It's about 300 lines of code. Um, no test, sorry. Uh, it's running on Amazon's EC2 servers. There's, uh, there's actually two pools of servers that I have. I have a web front end, which is managed by a, uh, it's a pool of web servers that do the, the web app. And there's a load balancer that sits in front of them. And then there's a pool of processing servers that I'm calling, which are actually doing the work. And again, it's processing photos, but this can be applied to a bunch of different domains and a bunch of different problems um, if you have you know, any offline processing needs. Um, all the storage, all the photos are stored on Amazon S3, meaning I don't have to store them on my servers and manage, uh, you know, where do I put these files, you know, do I put them on servers, do I need a SAN, all that kind of stuff. I'm also using a CDN, a content distribution network, and I'm using Amazon's CloudFront. And I'll talk more about these technologies later. Um, yeah. 
I'm using the right scale AWS gem for pretty much everything. So right scale, uh, which is the company I work for, has a pretty uh, extensive library for, uh, for using Amazon's web services. And uh, it's what we use for our own infrastructure, and it's what we distributed out you know, as, as open source. And it, uh, it's a library that covers, uh, that's a Ruby library for Amazon's EC2, S3, basically all of their web services that they offer, we have an API or a gem that you can use to access this pretty easily, and it's pretty simple to use. So again, why did I pick Amazon? And it's mostly because Amazon, why did I pick Amazon to, to deploy my, this, this demo app? And it's, a lot of it is they are the market leader as far as, uh, as, far as a lot of things. Uh, there's a lot of good competition, but right now they're, they're, it's pretty uh, indisputable that they are the big dog. Um, there's a lot of integration between the services, meaning if I have an EC2 server and I'm transferring data from between the servers, the bandwidth is free. Normally they charge you for, uh, for bandwidth, and bandwidth between the services is usually free. Um, and yeah, there's uh, APIs for all this stuff, and there's lots of documentation and lots of libraries. I'm, I told you I'm using WriteScale's AWS gem, but there's, a lot, there's actually a lot of libraries that are out there, so it makes it a lot more accessible if you're considering using some of these technologies. Um, Amazon's EC2. Just in case you're not familiar with what EC2 is, I'm sure a lot of you are, but I'm sure some of you aren't. It's basically it's servers on demand. You can basically, uh, with an API call, you can start up a server somewhere on Amazon's, on Amazon's data centers, and, uh, and you pay by the hour, which is nice, because like I said earlier, I don't, I don't want to pay for anything up front, let's say. I, I just want to pay for what I need, and this is exactly what Amazon's EC2 does. Um, one of the big caveats about Amazon's about EC2 is that it's not persistent, meaning that if you shut your server down, you, let's say you start it up, you configure Apache, you configure you know, your Rails application, and you get it nice and perfect, but the second that thing shuts down, it's gone. It's not, not persistent at all. So this kind of forces you to automate your configuration and, uh, a lot, which is actually good. Um, it lets you, it's kind of a pain up front, and it costs a lot up front to figure out, how do I get these servers to configure themselves when they come online? because you, know, you can build an image of a server once it's configured, but that's not very configurable, because if you, have, if you have five images for five different web servers, and then all of a sudden you need a sixth one, then you're gonna have to you know, build a brand new image for it, and it just does, that doesn't scale very well. Um, so there's a lot of tools out there. WriteScale is one of, that's one of the things that WriteScale does, but there's also you know, Chef and Puppet, and all kinds of systems configuration stuff that you can use. Um, Amazon also has an Elastic Block Store, which is a persistent, uh, disk storage that you can use for EC2 servers, but I'm not going to talk about that as much. Amazon S3 uh, is probably, I'm sure more of you have heard of, heard of or used Amazon S3. It's basically a publicly or a, 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 a online disk storage for you, for you to use. You pay for the data that you're storing, um, and there's some more, you know, some more up there for you to read. I'm sure you're more familiar with it. CloudFront. So CloudFront is a content distribution network that, I be, that I'm using, Pictor, to uh, get these images and, and get this content to the end users quickly, just like the, some of the other, clou or the other uh, content distribution networks like uh, Limelight and Akamai. So Amazon has uh, distribution uh, servers all over the world, all over the country. And once you associate a, uh, a CloudFront domain name, so if I register and I get a CloudFront uh, domain name, I'm basically registering an S3 bucket to be available to the CDN. So I get a special domain, and any time content is served with that special domain, it's actually going to be coming from the, cloud, from the CloudFront distribution network, which means that it's going to be closer to my users, and they're going to see the images quicker, which is something that I want. Um, this is Amazon's uh, their simplest API to use, and you can see the, the two lines of code that I actually used to create my CloudFront distribution which was you know, towards the bottom. It's a little bit cut off. But all I'm doing is I'm, I'm associating a, uh, an S3 bucket, which is a, a, a place for you to put your files. And I'm basically registering that as a cloud uh, front distribution. And I get back a domain name, which is a long set of strings, .cloudfront.ws.com, or something like that. And I can use that domain name to serve my images from. SQS, uh, Mike was talking about this earlier, um, is uh, Amazon's simple queue, which is a basic queuing service. So I put messages in a queue, and I pull messages off of a queue. I can, they can be up to 8K of text, 
And um, this is what I'm using for synchronizing my jobs. Once, I, once a user uploads a picture to Pictor, um, I create some jobs onto the queue, and the processing servers then pull these jobs off, process the images, and do, what is, do whatever it is they need to do with it. Um, one of the neat things that, that I think most uh, messaging, uh, messaging queues do is that um, if, my, if my processing daemon pulls a message off the queue, uh, it pulls it off and reads it, and then does some action, and then it explicitly deletes the message at the end, which means that, and then that message is gone forever from the queue, which means that if something dies and my, my job doesn't run properly, um, that also means that the message doesn't get deleted at the end, and it go, it'll go back on the queue after a certain amount of time. So that means you, you, know, you won't lose your, lose, your, uh, lose your job that you're running. It'll get, get put back on. This is uh, Amazon SymbolDB. It's Amazon's uh, non-relational database that they offer. And um, it's a, again, it's a simple database. And it's actually, this is actually one of the tougher ones, tougher things for me to figure out. It's a non-relational database. And uh, it's actually kind of confusing if you're coming from a relational kind of background, you know, using MySQL or whatever. Um, because there's no tables. They, they only, what, they call a ta what they call a table is actually a domain. They call it a domain. And you can think of it you know, maybe as a table or as a spreadsheet or something like that. But you can't do joins across two domains. So that forces you to really uh, denormalize your data and keep all the data you're probably going to need for one page or for one action in the same domain. And that sounds really dirty, and it doesn't sound very clean, and it, it kind of isn't, but it actually works out pretty well. Um, there's also no schema, so you don't have to plan up front what you want your, what you want your um, not your table, I almost said table, but you, you don't have to plan what you want your domain to look like. You define it as you go, which is pretty powerful as well. Um, there's some caveats to it, that all data is stored as a string, which means if you're storing stuff like dates or money or integers or you know, any kind of numeric uh, values, you have to kind of uh, change the way you do that a little bit sometimes. Um, SimpleDB automatically indexes all your data for you, so you don't have to uh, uh, do any kind of, you know, you don't have to run any kind of explain or analyze whatever. It kind of does its own thing for you. And it's also not, I, I, I put on here that it's not a speed daemon, meaning that, um, you have to hit the internet. You I mean you have to make an internet call every time you want to pull data from a database. So that's it's uh, it's not that fast. Um, as far as speed of the database itself goes, the speed of returning data and qu when you run queries amongst the data, it's pretty uh, linear. So if you have ten thousand or a million or ten million records in there, whatever it is, the uh, as the number of records go up, the 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 speed that it takes to query those stays fairly constant. So that's good. Here's an example that I pulled right from Amazon's website of what a simple DB uh, domain may look like. So you can envision it like a spreadsheet, like a spreadsheet um, with a bunch of columns that you can think of as, you know, like their attributes. So you have an ID, a category, um, subcategory, name, color. And then size, and then we have it here, make and model, which is kind of weird. So this is for a sample store that, that Amazon used as an, as an example. And so right here, so they have a couple rows, several rows of stuff that they're selling that's really related to clothing. So some kind of clothing that they were selling, this store decided to sell. Um, so the real interesting part, I think, is that with Amazon SimpleDB, for one attribute, you can store one or multiple values, which is completely different than than what you would see in a relational database. Usually this would have to be a separate uh, table that you would have to do some kind of joins on. But in Amazon SimpleDB, you can store multiple values for one particular attribute, and it works. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. But down here, it's interesting is you can see that all of a sudden we have, we are, we're dealing with clothing, and then all of a sudden we switch to, to cars and, and motorcycle parts. So instead of creating a separate table like you would think you would do in a, in a relational type database or, or multiple ones, you can just start adding attributes um, like make and model to your, uh, to your domain and fill them in as, as it makes sense. Here's some code that, um, that kind of ties in with the, with the previous thing. Um, with uh, the right scale AWS gem, we have a, um, an active, uh, 
a class called Active SDB, which emulates, not emulates, but it's similar to what Active Record is in terms of, of manipulating and grabbing the data. Um, when Sybil DB, DB first came out, they had its own query language that was very like algebraic and kind of kind of hard to understand. And uh, if you're not used to that kind of stuff, and they're supporting more and more like um, SQL type queries. So, so here's what. So here's an example. So I have a write AWS um, class. I have an, uh, a class called item, which inherits which inherits from ActiveSDB. Um, the first thing I would do is I would uh, call create domain, which actually makes a call to SimpleDB to create this domain. And you only do that one time. And the next thing I do is I create an item, um, item.create, and then I have some attributes in here that are not predefined. I'm just adding them in there, and they get added to the SimpleDB uh, domain as I call it. So I create an item that's called um, that's some kind of TV. It's in the electronics category. Then later on, in my code, I decide, oh, hey, I want to I add a new um, disc, uh, attribute to this, um, and I want to call it illumination. So if it, is it an LCD TV or is it an LED TV, I can use the, uh, the, the brace syntax here and just add a brand new attribute to this uh, Amazon SimpleDB domain, and when I save it, it gets, it gets added. Um, same, something kind of similar for storing multiple values for an attribute. When I, when I created this, my category was electronics, but let's say I decided I want to change the way I categorize stuff and I want uh, televisions to have its, have its own category. Well, then I can just append televisions to the, uh, to the category and, and it works. When I select, when I select an item using item.select, um, which should look very familiar if you've used Active Record before, or at least, yeah, it should look very familiar. Um, you can see down here I get, um, my size, of course, is 47. But in category, I, I get an array of values, which, which is electronics and televisions. So, um, and you can also query against, if, you know, if, a, uh, if an attribute has multiple values, you can query against the multiple values, and it, and it, and it works. Um, here's some, some of the caveats of using SimpleDB is that the data stores the string, which we talked about. The response cannot be greater than a megabyte of response. And if it is, then you get a token back, which you use for your next query to retrieve the next set of results. So they really limit you on that. Um, Amazon also times the amount uh, of, t of CPU time, however they figure it out, that your, um, that your queries take. And you can only use a certain amount of time per month, or depending on your plan. And the, but the maximum execution time per, for any query is five seconds. So. If you hit that limit, then you kind of have to rethink the way you're doing stuff. The big thing about SimpleDB is that it's, it's um, eventually consistent, meaning if you put some records in a SimpleDB domain right now, they may not be there immediately. So you can put some records in and then query for those records, and they may not be there. But they will be there eventually. Um, and this is a trade-off for, um, for availability. Uh, you can, you, <laughs> The idea is you can always write to SimpleDB. It, it, it should never, ever fail. A write to SimpleDB should never fail. Of course, your network, that kind of stuff can fail. But the actual writing should, should never fail. Um, and it's just a trade-off that they made. And, and I think a lot of the other non-relational databases that we see coming up are kind of making some of these trade-offs. Maybe not necessarily uh, eventually consistent, but people are starting to make some trade-offs. Um, and also the speed. Every call that you make is, of course, over the network. and for some of the benchmarks that I was doing, I was getting uh, like 100, it was about 100 milliseconds per call, which is you know, not bad. But if you have five, five calls per page, let's say you, you know, you're displaying a page that takes five calls, that can start to add up. So you really have to like, think about this uh, beforehand if you're, if, you're doing so, if you're doing a lot of queries. So I kind of went over all this, but what does all this mean? I can worry a little bit less about scaling, not a whole lot more, because I do have to worry about how this all fits in together in my configuration management and automation. Like I said before, the, the automation is, is, is important. Um, being able to get your systems to boot up properly, or boot up and configure themselves appropriately is, is pretty important. And uh, if you don't do that, then it could be kind of a headache. Um, the database performance is very consistent. Like I talked about with SimpleDB, uh, if you have you know, 10 million records, your performance for your queries and whatnot should be 
uh, fairly consistent, which is not like MySQL or whatever. If you start having a ton of records in there, your performance can start to degrade as you're, you know, you're writing to the database or whatever. Um, and that's what SimpleDB excels at. Um, S3 and CloudFront are going to be handling all my static file serving, which means I don't have to store them on my servers. I don't have to worry about um, the, perform you know, the performance hit my web servers take from serving all these static files because they're actually going to all be done from CloudFront, which are, you know, which are Amazon servers. My, my investment up front is minimal, and I'm only paying for what I need. Here's a diagram of what this, you know, this application kind of looks like. Um, so SQS and SimpleDB and S3 are all my cloud services that I'm using. My web servers and my converter servers, which are the processing servers, are two, on two separate pools. Um, my users are the people who are uploading pictures to Pictor. So what happens is, is they're going to be uploading the picture. I've even offloaded the, the, the uploading to S3. You can actually upload files directly to S3. So the old way of doing it, when S3 first came out was if you were going to be handling someone's upload, if they were uploading a file, you had to like store that file locally on your own, uh, on your own server and then somehow create a job or background process or whatever to then upload that file to S3. But now you can, you can create your upload form in such a way with the right um, signatures and, and, uh, and uh, identification or IDs so that they can directly upload it to S3. So that actually works out pretty well. So I'm, I'm really trying to uh, keep my, uh, I'm really trying to involve my servers as little as possible. Uh, sure. No, what happens is when you construct your, your upload form that the, or, you know, the form that the user is going to be, you know, clicking the upload button to, it's actually going to be uploading to Amazon directly. And there is, um, your, uh, your, your account, your account ID, which is you know the my account ID and uh, some other credential information, is embedded in as hidden inputs in that form to authorize that you know to for authorization. So yeah, so when the user clicks, so they pull the the page down, the HTML down for me, and but when they click upload, it uploads it directly to my S3 bucket. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Let me, I think that's on the, on the next slide. Yeah. So what actually happens is when Amazon receives that file, um, part, of that for, part of that hidden, or part of that form that the user uploads, one of the hidden values is a redirect URL. So when Amazon's S3 gets that file, um, they look for that redirect um, re URL and send that back to my user. So what happens is the users upload the, f upload the file. Um, if it's successful, they get a redirect to my servers which then, um, in this case, what I'm doing is, since I'm processing pictures, I create some jobs and I start working on that photo. And since it's stored on S3, I can get it immediately, right from S3. So, does that answer your question? It does. Okay, cool. Yeah, the old way of doing it, uh, before that, it was, it was, you had to do that. You had to either spawn a thread or do it in the background or, or something like that, which kind of made, made it a pain. So, this is how pictures work. And those, so, this is step one. Step two is once my servers receive the callback, or once they receive the request from the, from the uh, once that redirect comes back and they hit my servers, there is a, uh, a picture ID which is part of the URL. So I know what the name of the file is in S3. So, um, so what I do is I create uh, jobs based on that, that event, that picture. So in this case, what I'm doing is I have a class called a convert job which is a simple, um, it's a simple class that doesn't, that has some, that has a few, um, that has some, a few instance variables, and all it's doing is storing the name of the file and what I want, what I want it to do. Like, um, this is going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be applying an effect to this picture. I'm resizing it to 400 pixels, and I want to have the paint effect applied to it. Um, I'm creating two of them, and the second one is the monochrome effect applied to it. So I create these job, uh, these job um, instances, these convert jobs, and what I'm doing is I'm serializing them to JSON, and I'm putting this JSON into a queue, into the SQS messaging queue. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm doing right here, is I'm, I'm taking this class, or this, this object, serializing it, and putting it into the queue. And the convert job, I'll show it to you here. Let me see. This convert job class, actually I don't have it open. 
this convert job actually has a method on it called run, which, actually, which knows how to do the conversion itself. So, um, yeah, so this is it. So I store the, the name of the file, um, some suffix, the suffix of the file, and the size. And it has a run method, which actually knows how to call image magic and do all of itself. So the message that I'm putting into the queue is actually an instance of, uh, an instance of this convert job class. So, so that's what I'm doing there. So that's step one, was create those two jobs so that my processing servers can pull them off the queue and run them. Um, the third step is creating a simple DB record. So as, in addition to creating these two jobs, I'm creating a record in the database saying, hey, this picture is either about to be processed or it's in the middle of processing or it has already been processed. So I create a picture, um, a row in the simple DB domain, and what I'm storing the uh, image key, which is essentially the file name. And what I'm doing is I'm creating a, uh, an attribute called total conversions with the values of paint and monochrome. And what I'm, what I'm, doing, what I'm doing here is I'm letting SimpleDB know that, hey, I'm, I actually created two jobs. One of them I'm calling paint and one of them I'm calling monochrome. And so in my code what I'm doing is I'm, later on I look, I look for these attributes, paint and monochrome, in that in that simple DB domain, and those, those, the values for those are actually going to be the converted uh, image file names. That way I can tell if a picture is done processing or not. So, so I upload one picture, I want to convert it into two separate pictures, and once those, once those conversions are done, so once it's done doing the paint job, it, there's a new column in the database, or a new, um, a new attribute in the database called paint, and the value is the name of the file. So if both paint and monochrome attributes have a value to them, I know that it's done processing. So, so here's kind of what I was talking about. So before the, this picture is processed, this is what the uh, simple DB record looks like. And this is coming back from, from, uh, from the command line. So the key is called upload slash F1. Upload is my bucket name. And F1 is just the, uh, the file name. That's the original file. And my total conversions column contains two values, like I talked about a second ago, called paint and monochrome. So after both of these jobs get processed, or after each one gets processed, it adds the appropriate um, file name to the appropriate attribute. So after both, uh, pick, after it's processed and converted into two separate pictures, here's what it looks like. I now have a paint, uh, a paint attribute with a value, and the value is the file name, and I have a monochrome attribute and, and, the, um, and the values of file name. So what I can do is I can do a query saying, oh, hey, show me all the picture, you know, do a select where the, the values for total conversions, in this case, paint and monochrome, where both of those attributes are not nil. And if, if they're both not nil or not null, then I know that um, the picture is done. If they're, if they're empty, then I know that the picture's not done, that there's probably uh, the, conver the converter process the, or the converter daemon is still running. So, um, and here's my processor daemon, which is a, a loop that runs on a server, and what it's doing is it's pulling these convert jobs from the SQS queue, and as it finds them, it runs them. And the running, like I said earlier, is what actually does the work of, in this case, what I'm doing, for each uploaded picture, maybe I should have explained this, for each uploaded picture, two separate pictures are created. One of them has uh, the monochrome effect added to it, and the other one has the paint effect added to it and there's like a little watermark that gets applied. Like I said, it's completely arbitrary. But um, yeah, that's it. So let me show you the demo real quick. If you have any questions right now while I'm getting this ready, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, so right now what it is is it's a, uh, there's one daemon per server. I can show you my deployment here. I'm running one daemon per server. Ideally, it would be like probably 20 or 30 per server. But for this demonstration, I'm doing one daemon per server, and I have two, um, two of those converter daemons running. Right, that's why I'm using uh, SQS, the queuing service. So I put, I put these messages into the queue, and only one, they only get pulled down by one, 
by one process. So once it's pulled down uh, from Amazon SQS, it, it can't get pulled down again. Right. Yeah, that's that's kind of what that what that does. So I have two I have two web servers and I have two processing servers. And so you can see right here I have the host name of the server, or what I'm calling the host name. And if I refresh this, it's gonna you know change back and forth between App Server One and App Server Two. Um, but yeah. If I show you, so let me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna upload a couple pictures. And um, so a quick story. I did, a, I did a, uh, a mission trip with my church a couple years ago. We went to Guatemala and we took a medical team with us. And uh, there was a Guatemalan dentist that was there that was doing dental work on people, which there meant pulling teeth out. I mean, that's, that's what all they could really do at that point for a lot of these people. And so he was practicing his English and I was learning, you know, practicing my Spanish. And so we got to talking. And uh, I was asking him about what he does and what he, you know, how, how all this works. And he got very excited. You know? I think he thought I might have wanted to become a dentist or something. And so he was like, hey, if you want to watch me, help me pull out a tooth, you know, let me know. And I'm like, OK, thinking that you know, he was joking. But he wasn't. So, uh, so he showed me how to pull out this lady's tooth. And I, I got all gloved up. And we were in the middle of a pasture of a field. And there I am. Um, he's, he was very serious. Like, I really think he thought I was going to become a dentist or something. And uh, yeah, I, I pulled out this poor lady's tooth. <laughs> it looks pretty grotesque, but this lady was very thankful and uh, didn't like bat an eye when I showed up with a camera and put on a mask and started pulling out her tooth. I would have taken off, but she, she didn't think much of it. And she thanked me profusely afterwards, so that was kind of cool. So, here, so here's my application. Um, like I said, it's pretty bare bones. And what I'm going to be doing, how am I on time? Yeah, so let me upload a picture. So he, let me show you this form. So I'm, I'm going to upload this picture here. And while we're at it, I can show you this form as to what I'm talking about. Here's my form. And my action is to picter.s3.amazonaws.com. Um, so it's going to be posting directly to there. And I have a bunch of attributes or hidden values uh, that are, are signatures and access IDs and whatnot. So this is going directly to S3. And there's going to be, part of that is after that, after it's uploaded, I get redirected to my servers, which redirect me again back to the home page. And so um, what's happening right now is two jobs are getting created and putting into, being put into the Amazon queue, and a simple DB record was created. And as that, those jobs get processed, that simple DB record gets updated. So let's see if this works. It should. While this is uploading, any other questions? Doesn't have any what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is, uh, it's on GitHub, and I'll show you the slide at the end. My uh, username is iWarshag, so. so here we go. It took a long time to upload. So file upload, you know, here's the key, whatever is uploaded. So what I have running on, run, running on this screen right here is some JavaScript that's polling um, every, every uh, 10 seconds to see if these, pictures are, are, if these pictures are updated. And so as they become available, they get put on the screen. And so you can see that I have this color you know, this colorized, whatever you want to call it, effect added. And at the bottom, I have a watermark, which imprints the name of the server that processed this image. So I have processor, you know, there was two jobs, and I have two servers, and one happened to process one, and one happened to process the other. So um, I think that's about it. Do you have any other questions? Um, was it using HTTPS? I didn't even notice. Okay, so it's. I guess it. I guess it is using HTTPS to upload to S3. Um, I, I think that may be optional. I'm not. I'm not real sure. Um, let me check. Yeah, I guess it was using HTTPS. So yeah. So the so the upload to S3 was secure. Um, 
And right in here, part one of the, this form, right here's my my redirect. I'm I'm telling it to. Uh, so this reader, this uh, this URL is getting getting sent back to the user on, upon completion, and the browser is actually getting redirected to my server. And when it gets when the when their browser redirects to my server, that's when all this action actually happens to kick it to kick the process off. Um, and the rest of this is access keys and um, signatures of the form to make sure it wasn't tampered with. Um, any other questions? Yeah. To get upload status? Right. You know, I don't know. I don't, I don't believe so, but I can't say for 100% certainty. Yes? Right, I, I used, um, I actually used right scale to get these servers going. Um, and it, yeah, so no, that's not, that's actually not part of it. I'm sure you, that could be, but I used, uh, I actually used right scale to, get, to uh, set up templates. What I did is I set up templates for these servers, oh, okay. and then um, I launched them. So yeah, that's actually a, a separate part of it. Yes? Uh huh. Right, so what, one of the things is um, Amazon has their, uh, uh, I just forgot the name of it, but they have a persistent, uh, yeah, EBS, uh, Elastic Block Store. So you basically are creating a, uh, you can create a block, or a, uh, a block of data or a, you know, a block of disk drive that you can mount on any server. It can only be mounted on one server at a time. So what we do is we have, a, uh, we have an Elastic Block Store block that gets mounted on our database server and all of our MySQL um, data gets uh, is put on that elastic block store, so that if the server dies, then that data is still available. So that's what a lot of people are doing. Um, there, there have been some people that use S3 to do dumps, um, periodic dumps of MySQL to S3, but I think elastic block store is probably a better idea. Um, anyone else? Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much.